Good evening. Hello, everyone from LaSalle Public Library. This is Donna for tonight's virtual program. Uh, we have a couple of announcements, as always, at our beginning. Something that's particularly interesting tonight, but that'll be the last one. Uh, just wanted to let you know what you're seeing on the screen there with uh, Senator Everett Dirksen, uh, our IHC, Illinois Humanities Council Rhodes Scholar Speaker, Tiffany White, will present a biography of Senator Everett Dirksen, one of Illinois' most notable people and someone who was instrumental in passing the Civil Rights Bill of 1964. That program is at six o'clock on Tuesday, June 15th. Great news in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, Mark Walsinski will finally be back with us for a Zoom program about visiting and hiking in Starved Rock, based on his newest book, A Hiker and Visitor Guide to Starved Rock State Park. That will be again on a Tuesday, June 26th at 6 p.m. For all of you who have been waiting for this program, we hope to see you there. And to round out June, just to put it on the screen one more time, on the 26th, a Saturday at 2 p.m., we are hosting author Kate Moore in a program about her new book, The Woman They Could Not Silence. Two things about Kate's last book, The Radium Girls, has been a tremendous success. And like that book, her new book, reads like fiction, but in fact, it's a true story. The Woman They Couldn't Silence also takes place in Illinois, primarily in Mantino and Jacksonville. But as I finished the book, I felt like I had toured the state. So many towns make a cameo appearance and Granville plays a supporting role. So from Chicago to Kankakee to Springfield, the story of Elizabeth Packard was heard across the state and America in her lifetime and I hope you will join us for Kate Moore's program about how she came to write about this amazing woman. So that is Saturday, the 22nd, uh, 26th at 2 p.m. And fingers crossed, it doesn't rain this Saturday, June 12th at Rotary Park. The library will be hosting a star party with telescopes, astronomy binoculars, and plenty of expertise from the library's NASA Solar System Ambassador, Joel Knapper. We hope you can join us for a look at the night sky. For this event, which will be outside, face masks are required. Please register via our website and the star party will be from eight until 10.30 p.m. family friendly. One last announcement, tonight's presenter, Master Gardener, Natalie Martin, will be teaching us how to grow and cook our gardens. Natalie was our very first presenter on our Zoom journey and has been with us through thick and thin a virtual presentation adversity for one year to the day. So to celebrate that successful year of Zoom programming, all audience members who joined this webinar will have their names entered into a drawing for a $25 Amazon gift card. The winner will be announced at the end of Natalie's presentation and will be contacted via email to arrange for delivery of that gift certificate. And now starting another great year of Zoom programming, welcome Natalie. Hi everybody. I'm excited to be here for one year. Donna and I had a little like um, whole conversation about it before this got going about all the things that have happened in that year and I'm still getting it wrong every time I log on. Today I was muted and just took me a while to figure it out. So we're making it. Um, and thank you for those of you, I know I have some return names on uh, the participant list today. So thank you so much to those of you that have been patient through this amazing year. Amazing and maybe amazing is the wrong word. We did it though, we made it. Um, so thank you guys so much for joining me. Uh, we, I was gonna cook for you tonight, but let me tell you folks, it is so hot in this room that I am in that we're gonna, we're, I'll show you how to cook some stuff, but I'm not gonna turn a hot plate on in this room. And if you do see me actively sweating, just be very polite and pretend like you can't see it. Um, so we're gonna go through kind of uh, like we've done the other two cooking programs. We're gonna go through some of the um, things that the plants that you can grow to make these things um, that we're gonna talk about tonight. And then I'll do some hands-on demonstration and I will try to remember to maximize my camera so that you guys can see it in action really well, but also um, you can always uh, send, to put a thing in the Q and A. Oh, I know Donna used to said it the last time, but in case there's somebody that was not here last time, we are using the Q and A function. So at the bottom of your screen, you can see the Q and A little double bubble, um, thing maybe it's at the top of your screen wherever it is on your screen um 
we can, that is going to be where it's at. If you are having trouble seeing me, um, and if you go on your right hand side of your screen to view, you might want to click speaker view, see if that works, or gallery view, so kind of switching back and forth between those. Um, I know somebody just put in the chat that they had trouble. Um, I don't know how to help you troubleshoot other than that. But at the bottom is the Q&A and that I'll be keeping an eye on if you have questions um, about the stuff we talk about. So let's go ahead and kind of jump right in. Yeah, um, can, Natalie, yeah. I, I'm just going to interrupt you here. Yes. You know, that whole um, cloud interruption today that's been worldwide mm -hmm. has been affecting us periodically throughout the day. You oh. knew it would happen. It's only been a yes. year of this. Yeah. And um, so that could possibly be what is going wrong. I would ask that for those who are having trouble getting the view, could you please close out and log back in and let's see if that helps. Absolutely. If all else fails, we're keeping you in the drawing for sure. And we will have the uh, recording up tomorrow. But in the meantime, why don't you go out and quickly come back in and hopefully um, yeah. you'll be in on Natalie's program live. I hope I it's will, worth it. <laughs> it always is worth it. Okay, so we're gonna. I'm going back out. There you go, Natalie. Thanks. No problem. All right, guys. So we're gonna jump right in, and I will get my presentation going for you here. Of course, I wasn't ready with my actual like it's up on the screen, so you got to see a little behind the scenes. Um, and I'm gonna hide my camera because you know me. I tend to move around and gesture, and I'm sure um, I'm gonna be distracting. Oh, and we're not even at the front page. Boy, that's a sneak peek, guys. It's only been a year of this and I'm not I'm not getting it. Um, in case you are new and you're like, who is this crazy person? I am Natalie Martin. I'm a master gardener for LaSalle County. Um, the master gardener program, I'll have some information about it at the end, but we offer volunteer services um, through, there's a volunteer, uh, there's an extension office that helps, there's a master gardener um, extension office in every county in the state of Illinois. Um, and they, we provide programs about how you grow things on purpose. Um, there are master naturalist programs that are about wild world and the things that grow wild and animals in the wild. Um, but we're here in the master gardener program talking about the things that you can choose to grow in your own space. The program we're doing tonight is going to be how to um, make some main dishes or things that you can eat, you know, for your main course from your garden, things you can grow, um, and then serve to people and have them be really impressed with you. Um, and we're gonna talk about a couple of different plants. And the first one's zucchini. I know lots of people that grow zucchini um, here in the Illinois Valley, grows really well here. Sometimes people grow it so big and it's huge and it'll grow so many on one plant. Um, I would say that you know the average family wouldn't need more than one, potentially two, uh, zucchini varieties or zucchini plants oops uh in their yard just because it's so prolific but there's lots of things you can do with it um you can uh use it for a dish like we're making tonight you can just grill it you can make noodles with it you can do zucchini roll-ups and use them as a lasagna noodle or like a you know roll up a filling inside um you can make zucchini bread and use it to do things like that. So um, zucchini is really, really versatile. Um, it's a squash variety and it's part of a summer squash variety. So, you know, yellow squash, yellow summer squash is it's really closely related. It's just a different variety, but they are all related to pumpkins and butternut squash and all those different kinds. Um, and they just, they grow really, really well. Um, I don't personally grow zucchini in my garden just because it's a big space taker and I'm growing, um, you know, in a backyard. Some people, you know, it, it works really well for them. They're definitely gonna eat it. Um, I just want to, to grow other things. So I don't personally grow it, uh, but they do take, you can grow them in a row uh, just like a lot of other vegetables, or you can grow them in a hill. If you're going to grow them in a row, they have to be 24 to 36 inches apart. So that's two to three feet apart. And if they're in a hill, you want those hills, like a mound, four feet apart. So if you kind of think about that, about how you might, you know, I have four by four garden beds, raised beds in my yard. So one zucchini mound, which is like three or four uh, plants in a mound um, that would take up one whole raised bed. So you kind of just have to think about what the space requirements are for your garden, if that's something that would work with you, work for you. But if you do choose to grow it, it's a great plant. Um, 
you want to make sure like just with a, with a lot of squashes, you want to make sure that um, they're being pollinated. So you want to um, kind of, you can go ahead and uh, falsely pollinate them, which is take a paintbrush um, and go from plant uh, flower to flower and pollinate them yourself, or you can let the butterflies and the bees and the bugs do all the stuff they do. Um, so it really works well. They do have some pests, um, squash bugs and cucumber beetles, um, but for the most part, they do grow really, really well. As far as um, harvesting them, uh, you can, some people choose to do an early planting as soon as um, the last frost date happens. Now we got hosed real hard this year because the last frost date happened and we still had like two more weeks of really cold weather. But um, the after the last frost date, you give it some time, you can do it, you plant them directly into the ground. Um, and then after those, that first harvest, you can um, start over again and do a second round, either in the same spot or in a different spot in your garden. Um, so some people choose to do two plantings so that they can extend their season. Um, and then uh, when they're ready to harvest, um, depending on the variety, but um, these zucchinis, you know, in the picture, and I can, I can have one here, let me turn on my camera, you can kind of see this is about eight, seven, seven inches long, eight inches long. Um, you can see it's about, you know, just under two inches in diameter. But when you have your neighbors sometimes have um, zucchinis, you um, uh, can, they'll like, grow like gigantic. Um, but when you're using them for sauteing or um, ratatouille, which is what we're making today, or other things like that, you, um, they get really woody flavor. They lose a lot of that extra flavor. So you want to have them, um, you can use them for, you know, zucchini bread and stuff like that, uh, at that point, but to, to make things that where you really want to taste the zucchini, you'll want to harvest them when they're closer to this size, maybe a little, little bit bigger. Ooh, sorry, I got all my pots and pans. We had a question in the chat, in the question at Q and A about how to eat, um, zucchini blossoms or any squash blossom. So in this picture, I will turn off my key camera. Um, but in this picture, you can see this squash blossom. And when it's still here in this state, um, you know, I, I can maybe look up a little bit about um, there. You can eat them just like right. You can eat them raw. You don't have to cook them or anything like that. But um, you, I'm trying to figure out how to tell you how to like when they're too, when they're, when you shouldn't like if it's too far, once they start to kind of shrivel up and get a little brown around the edges, it's too late. You don't want those anymore. Um, and you always want to leave a few squash blossoms on your plants so that they can continue to be productive. But um, the you you can harvest them um, when the stem is like thin and trim. So like you don't want a big thick stem that it won't it won't be good anymore. But so then you can harvest them once you do. And that's the state that we see it right now. They're closed. Um, and you can fill them with stuff like, like, like cream cheese and things like that. You can batter them, you can fry them. Um, and they're just really beautiful, but you can eat them when they're raw. Um, and you just Google a recipe for squash blossoms. It will, um, it will definitely you've come up with all sorts of options. So really quick, just to show you. So this here on in the middle picture is that's where the squash blossom happens. So you can see this baby squash, um, right here, this would be where the squash grows. So you wanna wait while you wanna eat the squash blossom while it's still kind of closed up. It hasn't opened up like a balloon flower yet. So um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. Um, the, so that's a little bit about zucchini. Oops, tomatoes are next, surprise. Um, the, uh, sorry, I got distracted by the Q and A. A little bit about zucchinis. Um, it's it's a lot of the things that we're going to talk about tonight. We're not going to be doing a harvest on those things until you know late June, July. Um, my tomatoes are blooming right now, but they haven't started producing um, anything. So so you kind of think about that. We're we're doing this ahead of time so that hopefully you can kind of keep it in mind either when you're growing them yourself or when you're visiting the farmers market and you can kind of think about things to grow. We talked a little bit about tomatoes last night or last time. Um, and I know that some of you guys were there. So I won't, I don't wanna completely bore you with the same information, but um, we are using Roma tomatoes again. And um, this is a Roma tomato. You can see it's kind of oblong. Um, there's tons and tons and tons of different varieties of tomatoes. Uh, you know, the, um, these are 
Roma tomatoes are chosen for their high pulp content, so they don't have as many seeds. Um, I'll cut one open. They don't have as many seeds on the inside. So you can see this is the pulp. This is gonna be the stuff that makes your nice sauce. It's not gonna have as high of a moisture content. Um, so that is gonna be, that's why we chose um, aromas for tonight's recipe. Um, for things like slicing tomatoes or um, salsa, it's, you can use whatever variety works for you. Um, but aromas is what we're, we're choosing just so that they don't produce as much moisture. Um, they make aromas make great sauce. Um, they are like they held hold up really well and things like bruschetta, which we made last time. Um, but really, it's going to be about what you prefer. If you want, if you like those big beefsteak tomatoes for slicing and, and, and just eating plain, that's you know those are those big hearty ones or heirloom tomatoes. Those are great. And really, you can use any variety that you have um, for sauce or anything like that. It might just change the texture of it. Um, a lot of tomatoes, if you're, if you're not buying the plant at a store, you will want to start them inside, um, get those seedlings started inside and then transplant them outside. Make sure that you wait until after the last frost date and maybe even then a couple of weeks. Don't do what I did, which is put them out right after the last frost date and then have them die on you. Um, we tried all sorts of stuff with like tarps and stuff like that and they still perished, but we had, we had, we saved a couple. And uh, those are still growing and we bought a couple extra plants to um, substitute for them. But when you're choosing a variety, you really have to think about um, what your space requirements are. They make a lot of um, hybrid types now. Um, I buy a hybrid Roma, or I'm sorry, compact Roma, which is a Roma tomato, but it grows on a smaller plant and it grows smaller Roma tomatoes because I want to grow a bunch and I use containers and different things like that. I like Romas, but I don't have the space to commit to, sorry, I have my window open, there's barking dogs. Um, I don't have the space to commit to big tomato plants. So I use those compact Romas and I also do um, compact cherry tomatoes that will fit into um, things like that. But I'm the only person in my family who eats raw tomatoes. So I wanna buy, I want tomato varieties that are um, good for cooking. So I can roast cherry tomatoes and use those for sauces and cooking and pizza and stuff like that. Um, and I can make sauce with uh, Roma tomatoes. Um, what I do, I don't peel tomatoes because I don't want to spend the time on it. <laughs> but I know a lot of folks will um, peel uh, tomatoes. And when you buy the, the canned tomatoes, um, a lot of times they will come peeled. Uh, and, and that's just a textural choice. You're not going to lose anything by leaving the peels on. Um, I, I choose to, instead of the blanching and peeling, things like that, I choose to roast mine um, on sheet pans in the oven. Um, and then I freeze mine so that I have these bags of pre-roasted um, tomatoes that I can use for a variety of different things, salsa, sauce, things down the line, chili, um, whatever I really want. So it's really up to you what's gonna work for you, what space requirements you have. They need a lot of sun and a lot of water. Um, and then you, but like, as far as how much space they need, it's gonna depend on the variety. Um, you can, um, they usually will need like a, a couple feet apart, 12 to 12 for dwarf plants, 12 inches to for dwarf plants, two to three feet for regular size plants. Um, if you have really, really big heirloom indeterminate varieties, you may need up to four feet, but that's just like a, a wor worst case scenario, best case scenario, I got, it depends on what you on what you think. Um, when you hear about heirloom varieties, you hear about heirloom tomatoes a lot. And a lot of times that's associated with the really colorful tomatoes or the awkward sizes or anything like that. Heirloom variety just means that it's a type of tomato that has been passed down from generation to generation and their seeds can be traced back um, for a period of time. Um, you know, a lot of times they're sprawling and large and, and they, you know, they, they come in a little bit later. Um, but they will be the exact same seeds. All the heirloom seeds mean is that they're the exact same seeds from the parent plant. So the, they haven't been uh, combined with anything else. Um, and it's a, a lot of times, depending on, on what you get, you can get some really cool looking varieties. We used to grow purple heirloom tomatoes here. Um, so that's just really all about your preference. 
Uh, all right. And then the last one, well, not the last one we're going to talk about, but the second to last one we're going to talk about is eggplant. Um, and this is a fairly uncommon uh, thing grown in Illinois just because it's very, very sensitive. I'm sorry, grown in, in just regular gardens in Illinois. There are places that grow it, obviously. Um, not as many people grow eggplant. Some people do, but the season's so short here that it's going to be hard to get substantial size one. So a lot of times folks will choose a dwarf size eggplant, things like that, um, because they are very, very sensitive to cold. So um, they are definitely, they're considered cold sensitive. So they were, and they require a long uh, warm season for the best yield. And the best yield just means a very big uh, or preferred size eggplant. I'll turn on my camera again. Um, this is an eggplant that I got, well, half of an eggplant that I got at the grocery store today. So this is just a half. So you can kind of see how big that is. This is perfect for things like eggplant Parmesan, stuff like that. Um, but uh, you can see in the picture, there's that's a white eggplant that's gonna be a different variety. And then there's a long skinny purple one. And it's really, some of them are really cool. Some of them are purely decorative. Um, you do get a ton of different varieties uh, with eggplants as well, but not all of them are gonna grow well in Illinois. Um, they are again, a good plant to start from a seedling and transplant. Um, you can also buy them at the store, just buy the plants at the store. And they do require 18 to 24 inches, just like a lot of these other plants are similar. They're similar to a pepper and kind of how they grow pepper plant. Um, and then if you're looking to buy them to sustain your family, if your whole family eats them, you're not just, you know, doing it for fun. Uh, usually like three to three to six plants are going to be enough to get like through the whole season. So that's telling you just how few grow on one plant. So three to six, just eggplant plants is, is, is kind of a lot. So that kind of consider that um, when you're, uh, when you're choosing them. Uh, they do well if you give them nitrogen fertilizer, just kind of like peppers um, Peppers do. They get nice and big that way, um, but really they like the hot, hot summer. So if they have the right amount of water and the right amount of fertilizer, um, they'll go bonkers here in Illinois in the summer. But you want to make sure that you get them out plenty of time after the cold weather is gone. Um, they do uh, need extra water. If, because if you're looking at this plant, a lot of the eggplant is in, is predominantly water inside of it. So you, in order to have nice sized fruits, um, or some people consider it a vegetable, the seeds are technically on the inside, so it could be considered a fruit. Um, if you're gonna, you know, if you want a nice sized one, you are gonna um, want to have a lot of water for them. And then we'll talk a little bit about herbs. Um, the extension has a great herb directory, tons of different varieties that can be grown well in Illinois. Um, we're going to be using basil and thyme tonight uh, and parsley. So, uh, you know, herbs grow really well. Parsley grows really well. Thyme grows really well. Thyme, my thyme uh, is usually a, a perennial. So it comes back year after year. Basil grows really well in Illinois. Um, and it's just, it, they're nice. Some of them can be great pollinator plants like mint and things like that. Um, this is Anna's hyssop in this picture. Um, and that's a great pollinator plant. And it, it's just, it's something that you can grow fairly easily. You can grow it in containers. So they're just kind of fun to have those herbs that you can run out and use um, all throughout the summer. Uh, oh, I'll show you uh, really quick. Um, the, I don't know how to switch to this new. There we go. What, um, I hope you can see it. it. Looks like I'm on it. Okay. Well, I, if you can see it right now, I've got my um, basil uh, up here. This is the herb directory on the extension. Um, there's tons of different kinds of basil, lots of um, different countries like Thai, Thailand has their own kind of basil. Greeks uh, have their own kind of basil and they just, depending on where you go, they can grow and they have a slightly different flavor um, depending on, um, on where you get it from. So, but the directory is great because it talks about how you grow them and, um, and what kind of you have to do and how, you know, what kind of sun they need and stuff like that. So feel free to use that herb directory. All right, we're growing red, we're cooking ratatouille and I'm gonna stop my share um, in just a second here to show you guys the preparations. But um, on the screen right there is a, a layered ratatouille and you can kind of see it. It's like a beautiful, that this is on a plate, not in the actual um, uh, dish. And we'll show you that, but 
ratatouille is kind of a, originally it's a stew. Um, so you, I also included in the chat, there's going to be um, links to uh, ratatouille, one pot ratatouille that is like more like a stew style. Um, this one's going to be a layered ratatouille again, because it's so hot in here that I thought I might pass out on screen if I had to cook something. Um, and it's made up of literally anything you have in your garden, um, but we're using tomato, eggplant, and zucchini, and those are pretty traditional. Um, a lot of uh, recipes call to make your own um, sauce, especially in a lot of them use bell pepper. So this is a traditional French dish, and a lot of bell pepper is used in the sauce. It's really about um, whatever your preference is. I'm going to use jar, jar sauce tonight, but I thought I would also show you um, a little bit about how I make canned tomato sauce, and then I'll talk a little bit about how I make regular non-canned tomato sauce. So um, the base in, if you look in the picture, and I'll show you in here, are, we're going to have a baking dish, um, just, you know, whatever kind you want. You don't want it to be a really deep casserole. Oops, I've got herbs escaping. Really deep casserole, but a couple inches. Um, and we're going to put sauce in the bottom, tomato sauce, whatever flavor works for you, works for me. And then we're going to layer our uh, tomato uh, eggplant and zucchini in there. But you can really use, if you have yellow squash, you can use that. You can layer some thinly sliced onion in here. Um, it's really going to be what you want. But if you do want to make your own sauce, um, you can do it a couple of different ways. I do roast, do like roast the vegetables ahead of time on a sheet pan with garlic and onion and, and tomato. And then you kind of add some liquid and, and do that with your, your stuff from your garden. Or if you wanted to use, you can use just like a, a canned tomato. And if you're doing that, you would saute all, all of your um, sofrito is a way to say it, or um, the Holy Trinity is another way. So you use garlic, um, onion, carrot, and celery, and whatever combination thereof that you like. Some type will use bell pepper. Um, it's just really up to you. You can buy a couple of different kinds of tomatoes. These are peeled whole tomatoes. So when you're using these, a lot of times folks will um, prefer whole tomatoes because they can, every, anytime you process something, it ends leaving a flavor. So if you're using whole tomatoes, that means it's the least processed product um, and will leave the least metallic taste in there. You can also buy crushed tomatoes, which is just like these. These are fire roasted crushed tomatoes. So if you're buying these, that gives you that caramelization, that charring that would be from the fire roasting. Um, and then they crush them afterwards. You could do that yourself, oven roast them or grill your tomatoes, um, and then you know put them in your sauce and use an immersion blender or cook all of it together and put it in a regular blender or food processor or something like that. Some folks really like the chunky stuff in there, so they'll just slice up their tomatoes um, and then let the kind of cooking process break them down um, and have that in there. And then really the, the ingredients are up to you. I always like to add a little brown sugar to mine because we like our sauce a little sweeter. Uh, red wine, uh, some people put a little balsamic vinegar. Um, it's really gonna be whatever your preference is and kind of play around with it and, and see how it goes. But tonight um, we're not making sauce. I'm just gonna use uh, just a regular tomato basil sauce. This is from Aldi's, whatever your preference is, you can use. Um, but in the recipe in the, in the chat, there is, um, a recipe for homemade tomato sauce with bell pepper, if you would like to use that. So the key to this layered ratatouille is going to be thinly slicing your vegetables. I really wanted a small eggplant, but what I got, as you saw, was this girthy boy. Um, so I had to hand slice because I couldn't use a mandolin. A mandolin is a, it's a blade and it's a slicing blade. And I'll use my zucchini as an example but you can set your you can set your thickness um, you can make it thicker or thinner um, depending on what you want and then you can this is going to drop and be very oh i need to make my camera bigger sorry i'm going to stop my share I, there um, and you can see it just kind of falls out the bottom and that, let me get you a good, and that will make a perfectly thin thing. This is just from Target. It's an OXO brand mandolin. There's some really big ones that are countertop size or really large and you know, have a big wide blade. And that's what would be great for this eggplant. Um, but uh, the nice thing about a mandolin is that it 
um, makes everything consistent. So the thing you want things to be at least very similar in width for this so that everything kind of cooks at the same um, the same uh, pace. You don't want to have um, things that are cooking way faster and get mushy um, or you know aren't cooked enough. So I'll bring this over here. So when you've got your stuff all ready, we've got our um, stuff all sliced. What I did because my eggplant was so big, I cut it into quarters and then did that and, and then had them nice and thinly sliced. And then I've got my zucchinis that we've got in our nice thin slice. And then I've got some tomatoes. Now tomatoes can be, if you have very ripe tomatoes, they are not going to go on the mandolin. Let me, but these ones you could, I was able to, to run it on the mandolin. Um, but sometimes the skin, depending on the, um, how ripe everything is, it will tear and you won't get that full thing. So you can do it just to consistently cut it, but you can also just slice your tomato as thin as you possibly can. And that works good too. You want a nice sharp knife, uh, to make that happen. So as you go through, you've got your ingredients. I've got my uh, slices of tomato and my pattern was eggplant tomato, zucchini on top. And it makes this really nice like little trinity. Um, and then I just make little stacks and get them ready. And then I'll show you how we assemble them. Um, and this is an oven baked dish. So if you are in a very hot house, like I am, you can, I will kind of talk a little bit about a stovetop recipe because originally this was not how ratatouille was made. Originally um, it was made as a stew. Uh, and then people kind of started to get a little fancy. Um, but we've got our little stacks here and you can continue to make them as much as you want. If you've got a big casserole, I'm gonna make a little tiny guy because I'm my husband and I are the only people that are gonna eat. If you've got a big guy like this, you'll do it in a circular pattern. You'll start in the middle and work your way. Uh, start, yeah, start in the middle and work your way out, filling in as you go. With a square one like this one, I'm gonna do a row and a row and a row, and I'll show you how we do that. But with this recipe, you're gonna put your sauce in the bottom. And this sauce is gonna be, um, you know, like normally if you were doing it as a stew, it would be all kind of mixed together. You want it nice and coated. And then you will take your little lines and you start to spread them out just like this so that they fill the whole thing. And then you take your next row. I like to go, if I'm getting really fancy, I like to go the opposite way, which is this way. So then you're gonna kind of spread out your little deck of cards here, get it kind of squished in there. And then we do our third one. I didn't get enough layers together here. So we've got tomato, or I'm sorry, eggplant, tomato, zucchini, eggplant, tomato, zucchini. And you can see it, mine's not perfect as far as like everything being the same thickness, but it's pretty close. The reason that I wanted um, really the appeal of having the um, zucchini and the eggplant all be the same size as far as diameter is just looks, you know, you want everything to lay kind of similar and we want to get as many like nice little layers in there as we can. So we've got our, got to kind of get it nice and layered in there and then you're going to bake this and when it bakes in the oven it'll kind of melt together and all your your vegetables will kind of melt together and then you'll just scoop out a row at a time um things like that but again some of oh and then we've got time this is this is um this is the herb thyme. And if you haven't worked with thyme before, thing that's one of the things that you need to pay attention to is that the stem is very woody. Like with parsley or other herbs, um, if you eat the stems, it's it might taste a little different or might have you a different texture, but thyme just really will not break down. If you use it in things like beef stew, um, you'll want to take the leaves off or leave the leaves on the stem and then pull the whole stem out at the end when you're done cooking. So we're going to sprinkle this on there for our cooking. It gives you this really nice aromatic um, thing. And if you look at how I'm doing this, I'm just taking the stem and I'm pulling it backwards in the opposite direction it grows. And it just pulls it off 
the whole stem so that you can see it kind of just takes all the, I don't know if you get there, you can takes all the leaves off, but leaves that woody stem there. And so then we're gonna sprinkle this on and that's gonna kind of permeate through the whole thing. If you wanna get really fancy, you can tuck some whole stems down in the middle, but then you have to remember to take them off because when you do get those woody stems in your mouth, it's just not, it's just like finding a stick in your food when you weren't expecting it. Um, so you'll cook this. And then the only last step that you would do when you take it out um, is you would sprinkle, you would chop up some uh, basil. I've got some fresh basil here and you would chiffonade it on the top and, um, and do that. Basil is another one where it's not that the stem is hard and woody. It's just that it doesn't taste as good. So you really, when you're using basil, you'll pull the whole stem off of the leaf. And then what I like to do, get my pan out of the way. I like to roll them up. Oops, I lost one. I'll roll them up. And then you can run your knife. It'll make you look like a really fancy chef, even though you're not. And it just kind of breaks it up into these little chiffonades. And then you'll sprinkle that over the fresh basil over your cooked, um, I'm, all, I'm all messy and I didn't bring a towel this time, over your cooked um, ratatouille is the name of this dish uh, at the end. And it'll bring that brightness, kind of a green flavor to it because it's going to be a roasted vegetable dish. So it might, it's not going to be heavy because it's only vegetables. There's no cheese. There's no fat really. Um, but it, it, you know, it's going to be a warm, a warm, savory dish. Uh, sorry. One more thing. You will want to salt and pepper this season, season it because those vegetables are going to be a little bland. Um, you will want to taste your sauce just to see how salty that sauce is. Um, and, and go from there. I am going to put my screen share back on while I get my, um, uh, my, area cleaned up and started for our next recipe. Um, so I want to hear if you guys have made uh, ratatouille before. I want to hear um, if you have um, ever, if you want to try it, if there's some things that you think might be good in it. Um, maybe not, maybe you're not a zucchini person. You maybe like something else. Um, so definitely uh, let, let us know if you're going to do that. The next thing that we're going to be making is um, something called gremolata. And if you've ever, I'm not sure if you guys have ever had gremolata before, um, it's like a topping. So, uh, you know, when you talk about main dishes, you know, folks might've been thinking, oh, well, she's gonna make like a whole, you know, main dish. Well, the thing about a gremolata or it's relative chimichurri, um, romesco, uh, you, you can put it on anything. You can put it on, um, you can put it on meat, fish, vegetables. So it's really versatile, and it is just it brings brightness to everything you're cooking. It is, it just really they take something like so. I wanted to have it along with our ratatouille because you could have some roast fish or some pan seared fish, grilled fish um, with your ratatouille, and then you. Can, Sorry, my cat is right next to me and I knocked something off, some piece of food off onto him. Sorry. Um, you can have a piece of fish with your ratatouille and then have this gremolata on top. I was going to make fish for you guys today, but the idea of cooking fish inside when it's so hot out made it sound like it was going to smell inside this office forever and ever. And I just thought that that was a bad idea. Um, so we talked about a mandolin already. Um, we're going to use another special tool um, to make this gremolata, and that's a microplane. Um, I guess I should talk to you about what we are using this for. So I'm just show you my microplane, and then we'll talk about it. This is a very simple recipe. It is three ingredients: parsley, garlic, lemons. That's it. Um, pesto is a very similar thing. This is with parsley. Pesto is usually with basil. You can also do it with. Um, carrot tops. If you grow carrots in your garden, this is a great use for all those green carrot tops. I make a gremolata with those. I make a chimichurri. Chimichurri is um, parsley, cilantro, usually a little red wine vinegar and some garlic. Um, this is uh, just the parsley part, um, you, but you can substitute out either one of those greens with carrot tops. Um, like I said, pesto, which is very similar. 
uh, is with basil usually, and then they add a nut, maybe some Parmesan cheese. So you can kind of add things. I've seen um, recipes for gremolata that have pine nuts added into them, sunflower seeds. It's kind of whatever you want, but garlic, lemons, and then a green is usually the base uh, for a gremolata. And you can see in the picture, they're all kind of mixed together. Um, there's not even salt in this. There's literally three ingredients. Um, I'm using curly headed par parsley today because that's what um, they had. I will turn off my share. Uh, curly headed par parsley. Um, flat parsley looks exactly like cilantro. You can really only tell the difference if you smell it, but um, you can see it's curly parsley is, is kind of, it's kind of curly. It tastes almost exactly the same. I think, I don't think there's really that much of a difference. Um, it just has a little different texture. And for this, I kind of like that texture. I like that um, kind of, coarseness almost of the curly um, for, for this dish. So I've already got some roughly chopped, you can kind of see roughly chopped in there. So um, when you're making gremolata, you are going to um, make some garlic or make some garlic. You're going to microplane some garlic and this is a microplane. You can see it's just like a grater, but it's gonna be a really fine grate. This is great for things like garlic, ginger, um, and then lemon zest. And um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take, I'm gonna make a little mess here, but I've got my, cook, my uh, cutting surface and I'm gonna put my parsley on there. And then I'm gonna microplane some garlic. And I'll show you exactly why a microplane is great because you can just, you know, chopping garlic really fine can be really hard and take a long time. Um, but when you use the microplane, you can see it turns it into a paste kind of, it can get really fine, especially if you're sensitive to garlic, it's a great way to kind of get it dispersed well in the dish. So you're not eating big chunks of it, um, kind of make it, I know that if you've been to my programs before, I love garlic, it completes me, makes me who I am. Um, and no one is judging my use of uh, garlic. Now this recipe calls for one clove. And again, as we've covered in the past, um, you measure garlic with your heart, not a measuring spoon. So I'm using two cloves of garlic. Um, probably somebody can chime in in the Q and A and tell me that I'm going to have a shorter life because of all the garlic that I get. Most likely really, you can just chime in and say, Natalie, I can smell you from here. And that's fine. Luckily, this is a virtual program. So, uh, we have, we're going to microplane our garlic into here. This is a great dish. I think I, you know, I talked about carrots, carrot tops. Um, I really, uh, we have a program coming up later in the year called cooking with garbage. And it's going to be about using all those things that normally you would throw away, um, and about how to use them to make other things. So we'll do carrot tops. Um, we'll make carrot top chimichurri in that program. But, um, so I'm mixing my garlic together with my parsley. And then I'm going to microplane my lemon zest. This calls for the zest of two lemons. If you've never zested a lemon before, it's going to take a while. So sit in for the long haul. You don't want, you want to zest it just enough so that you get through the yellow parts and you're not getting that white bitterness. That white pith is um, pretty bitter. And, and a little bit is okay, but you really don't, the, the best parts of the lemon uh, zest are gonna be in the, all the bright yellow parts. So once you get into that white part, it's just really not gonna be a great flavor anymore. So the whole point of this lemon, having the lemon zest in here is to get this nice bright uh, uh, citrus flavor um, and only that flavor. So you may ask like, why is this so dry? It's more like a crumbly topping rather than a um, thing. If you wanted to make it more liquidy, you could add a little olive oil and a little lemon juice. So you can kind of see, I just asked my lemon. I, it's not perfect. I didn't get a hundred percent of it, but I got most of it. You can go through and get these little patches if you want. Um, and then we'll do this second one. So what we're going to do is zest this lemon in here, and then we're going to chop it all together until it's really fine. And when um, when it's really fine, that means that all of the uh, flavors are mixed together. Um, that means that when we crumble it onto our, our fish or our 
pork, people use this for lamb. If you're a lamb eater, you can definitely use it for beef. Like you're gonna do a steak or flank steak would be great with this. Um, and you sprinkle it on the top, it means you're not gonna get an overwhelming hit of parsley, an overwhelming hit of lemon, overwhelming, overwhelming hit of garlic. You're just really gonna get the flavor of all of it together. And that's the whole point of us chopping this up really fine. Um, so you can see I made a nice pile here and I'm gonna grab my knife. Um, I use this kind of Santoku knife. This is a flat bottom chopped, you know, um, just chef's knife, um, whatever knife you've got, but you will want a bigger blade knife rather than something small because it'll just go faster. Um, when you're using, you know, you could, you could probably do this in the food processor, but it would turn more pulpy. It would start to really break down those, um, hope you can hear me over my chopping. It would start to really break down that, um, parsley and it wouldn't be as crumbly. So if you were going to use a food processor, I would say to, to put it on pulse, just pulse it very fast in short bursts so that it doesn't start to mash everything. And it really um, keeps it, it's cutting it. You want to really focus on cutting it rather than smashing it. So a sharp knife is important. So you're not just bruising it and breaking it apart. Um, and you can kind of see as I'm doing it and you can kind of give it a little toss if you're worried about things not getting mixed. Um, you can see it's really starting to be uniformly sized, and turn into this really beautiful crumbly topping. Um, so if you can kind of see it, you can, you can see a little bit of lemon zest here and there, see a little bit of big um, parsley leaves here and there, but really, it's pretty uniform and beautiful and um, it will be great on anything. You could even put it like on an avocado toast. That would be awesome. You could put it on eggs, like really anything you want. So um, highly recommended. I hope you guys give it a shot. Um, I think I referenced that there's some similar um, like relatives to gremolata, things like chimichurri, things like pesto, and really kind of depends. Gremolata, pesto, they're both Italian. Chimichurri is, I believe, Brazilian or Argentinian. Um, and a lot of those are made like pesto. You can put it on pasta. You can put it on um, uh, meats. You can put it on just bread because why not? Bread makes everything great. Um, so you know, but it's a, it's all, you know, all using the greens from your garden in, um, in just a simple and fresh way. And it kind of makes it a really nice summer topping for anything. Um, but what I was going to serve it, if I was going to serve it with this, I would be make my ratatouille and some, um, like white fish, like tilapia or swai or whatever. You can get that cheap white fish at the grocery store, um, sustainably harvested if you can. Um, but, uh, whatever white fish you'd like. You could do it on salmon. Um, salmon's a great bright flavor. So you can, you know, or strong flavored fish. So you could definitely use it on salmon as well. And those are all pretty easy to find um, in your grocery store, but it would be great on chicken, whatever you want. So that's how I would have served it tonight is make a grilled meat or pan seared meat and then do this gremolata on the top with the ratatouille on the side. And it's like a perfect summer meal. Um, all stuff that you can grow in your garden and, um, and yeah, I hope you guys give it a shot. That's all I have tonight, Donna. I, I, uh, I'm, I'm done. I'm done cooking. I'm very messy and covered in green stuff. Um, okay. did anybody, did anybody have questions about stuff that we talked about tonight? I know let, we talked let me, about squash blossoms, but, um, yeah, you answered that one. I, I'm one, this just, the gremolata looks so wonderful. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to use it with potatoes? I'm thinking potatoes. So oh, yeah. Potatoes. You know, even, of course, I've so, never made a potato I didn't like, so I could put it on hot or cold. You could probably do like, um, I, like I do a potato salad with um, like a yogurt instead of mayonnaise. And you could do yogurt and a little of the lemon juice and like, a, you know, cook the potatoes, yogurt with a little lemon juice and a little olive oil. Um, and then mix this gremolata in with those potatoes and make like a really bright potato salad. That would be great. Um, you could roast your tomato or roast your potatoes and then sprinkle this over the top or throw them on the grill. If you're already grilling fish or whatever and you throw those on the grill with it, that would be awesome, 100%. Sounds delicious. Actually, it's really good. If you have a recipe, add it to the list, would you please? <laughs> 
as as always, we will be adding all of um, information oh, to the website. I did want to show you guys really quick um, the ratatouille stew style. Um, are you seeing? Wait, I think I shared the wrong one. Are you seeing my ratatouille on the screen right now? Because it's showing me something different. I'm seeing a recipe for easy ratatouille. Yes. Okay. Perfect. So this is ratatouille as a um stew so you can kind of see it's got this is yellow summer squash here tomatoes um there's bell pepper mixed in and this is just a one pot recipe this is in the chat um and oh, eggplant as well and so you just kind of cook all of this saute it and then um cook it for like 20 minutes um in a big dutch oven or a sauce pot or whatever you've got um and with garlic and thyme and you can throw bay leaf in there um and then you know, they, it looks like they cook the, some of the zucchini um, and the eggplant ahead of, they, they cook it ahead of time to sear it. And then they, um, they do it. it. looks like we have a raised hand or maybe I accidentally raised my hand. I'm not sure how I did that. Um, thank you, Chrissy. Okay. So anyway, so I hope you guys did yeah, take a look at this other one. If you don't want to use your oven in the middle of the summer, or you don't want to arrange the, the vegetables like that. I totally get it. Um, but uh but yeah so this is a, a second option for you um thank you chrissy i'm so glad you joined us tonight um but uh, but yeah so i hope everything everyone gives it a shot um like i said one of these things that you can really scale this up you can double it triple it this is like a half serving maybe of what the um uh what the recipe calls for but it looks beautiful and if you have to like take a dish to pass or you have a vegetarian in your family um it's a really great hearty dish that you can that's like a good crowd pleaser um i think it's kind of like eating a really yummy tomato saucy dish um but it's it's really great if you have a gluten-free person in your life it's really great if you have a vegetarian in your life and you can bring that and, and you can bring a whole big casserole dish of it and have it as a side dish. You can eat it kind of room temperature if you want because it's there's no cheese or anything in it. So you can, it's really pretty versatile. So can of keep that in mind? Well, it all looks just so yummy. I can't wait till the garden comes in. Um, <laughs> it's going to be a long time for us. We did get our seedlings started on I know time. you said that you got them all, you got them all in. Uh, we did start a second round. I think if you guys were in my program last month, we did lose a whole bunch of our peppers um, and we started some, and we had rabbits eat what the weather did not um, ruin, um, but we started some new seedlings. So we might get a late harvest. We'll have to see how it goes. It, it's going to be delicious no matter what. But before <laughs> we close off tonight, we have to say who our Amazon winner is. Yes. Barb Warnell. So Barb, uh, we'll send you an email and we'll make arrangements to make sure that you get this Amazon gift card. So Yay, thank Barb. you for participating with us all these times. And Natalie, yes. I am going to just say thank you once again for another delicious program. <laughs> And when when's our next one? It is our next one, I believe, is July 20th. And it's desserts, yes. folks. So oh, we're going yeah. to um I'm gonna try to make some stuff here on camera, but I am gonna bake something ahead of time. So yeah. um depending on what is fresh at the time, I'm gonna try to either use I just I showed Donna we have this giant strawberry harvest that we just did. Um, but it's gonna be past strawberry time by then. So we're gonna kind of see what we've got. We have blackberries and raspberries and mulberries in our yard. So if I can try to do something from my yard, I'm going to. So it'll just kind of depend on what is fresh at that time. Well. I just can't wait after this. I just can't wait to get home and eat. <laughs> and, uh, I, I, it's I wanna, dinner time. <laughs> I, I want to uh, let, let you go cook too and yes. get the green stuff off your hands. I'm going to have ratatouille for dinner. Very good. <laughs> have a good Thank night, you. everybody. And we'll see you in July, hopefully. Thank you. And good night Bye. to everyone. Bye-bye.